Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 12th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Dukes Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the three things we hope the legislature's new comprehensive fiscal policy working group puts front and center in their hearings. Second, we explain why we think the governor continually falls short on proposing a complete fiscal plan. And third, we explain why we think the Biden administration is directly targeting Alaska in its recent order reopening the environmental review of the LNG project. And now, let's join Michael. All right. Well, let's uh, let's dive into this, Brad. We've got uh, we've got some uh, some things to discuss, including uh, the you know some of the top issues here that are important for this working group. We've had some conversations yesterday. We talked to Shelley Hughes last week. We talked to uh, Kevin McCabe. Um, and so, what are what's what's your what's your thing? What are the three things you think are important for the working group um, in here in the state? Well, the inspiration for for this is a is a conversation or a or a report that uh, that uh, 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 the the public radio station down in uh, Kenai had with uh, with Ben Carpenter last week, and uh, toward the end of that, the article on that or the of the, of the uh, conversation they had, Ben said that uh, to build trust uh, in the working group, he thinks it's important that all eight members have input on how meetings are run, including what's on the agenda, what conversations, and, and the conversations happen in the open, not behind closed doors. But it's the agenda portion that I think um, is significant. W what we've seen over the years in the Alaska legislature is that the majority sets the agenda, right? They set, they invite the guests, uh, they set what's talked about, they control uh, the agenda, and as a consequence, uh, we've seen several things uh, about the PFD not get highlighted that you and I have talked about and I, and I think are important to highlight. Um, and so given, you know, Ben's focus on, and I think an absolutely correct focus on the fact that the working group is, is evenly split, all of the delegations, all of the caucuses have equal representation, and the focus is on um, uh, it, Ben's focus is on uh, uh, having equal access to the agenda. It struck me that it might be useful to outline the three things that I think would be important for to, to be on that agenda, to be talked about, to be upfront, uh, and uh, and to have sort of um, uh, as a keynote to the to the working group's uh, activities, things that have not gotten emphasized, things that have not gotten highlighted uh, during the time that the uh, the PFD cutters uh, have, have been in control. So the three things are simple. I mean, they're things we've talked about on the show. The first thing is who pays? Uh, uh, talking about the fact that that using PFD cuts uh, to uh, uh, to fund government have has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families. It shoves the burden uh, to middle and lower income Alaska families. It's the chart I've used over and over and over uh, out of the ITAP uh, uh, 2017 story, uh, 2017 report that dem that shows who is paying uh, when we use uh, PFD cuts, and then layered on top of that, uh, the additional part of the 27 ITAP report that shows who pays 
uh, with the other potential uh, revenue options and a more equitable, resulting in a more equitable distribution uh, of the cost. I think one of the stories, you know, you and I have talked about this before, but I think one of the stories that has been missed uh, in this entire discussion about the PFD is is the is the effect it's having on Alaska families and the effect of shoving it, uh, shoving that burden off on uh, middle and lower income Alaska families. So that right. would be number one. If 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 there is input to the agenda, uh, and and sort of a input to the keynote of of what the working group is going to keep in mind uh, throughout its deliberations, I think the first ought to be uh, oh, who pays. The second is the relative economic impact of the options. The 2016 ICER study showed that uh, uh, using PFD cuts to fund government has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy uh, of all of the options. That never gets, that has not been uh, uh, talked about uh, at all during the, the course of the debate. It's always, well, PFD cuts, you know, we can grab money from that, and, you know, it's just free money anyway, so we'll just grab that and use that to fund government. But using that source of, of revenue has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. Other sources of revenue have a lower, uh, 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 more muted impact on the overall Alaska economy. I think that's an important consideration, an important keynote. Uh, that the working group uh, uh, should should hear, and as importantly, Alaskans should hear, because I, the working group is obviously going to be reported on well by uh, various Alaskan news outlets, and what the working group considers important and what they use as their keynotes uh, will be reported on in the press as well. So I think this is I think the the adverse overall adverse impact uh, on the Alaska economy of using PFD cuts, getting that front and center. And then Ben and others going back, Ben, Kevin, Shelley, others going back to it over and over and over again during the discussion. Look, we, you know, so for example, look, we heard that using PFD cuts has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families, uh, uh, unfairly distributes the burden to middle and lower income Alaska families. Using that as as sort of their 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 touchstone to go back to during the during the discussions as we as we work through uh, how we're going to have an overall fiscal solution. I think I think that uh, that's important. And then the third is something that we've talked about on the show as well, which is futures oil price, future oil prices, because I, I, I am concerned. I continue to be concerned. And we'll talk about this in the next segment uh, that the governor is trying to set this up as uh, all we have to do is fix the PFD and 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 you know fix uh, 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 do a little bit of spending cuts and then and then we'll be fine from here on out. Um, that's not true, and it's not true in 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 significant part because of uh, future oil prices. There, the administration, uh, the revenue forecast the administration used came out with in the spring shows continuing upward uh, 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 tilt. Uh, in oil prices through the remainder of the decade. But when you look at the futures market, uh, it's a continued downward tilt. By the end of the decade, we're back down in the 50s uh, again. So I think it's important that to, to set the tone here that, that we understand what the futures market is telling us. We take advantage of what the futures market is telling us on oil prices uh, so that we don't, uh, we don't think that uh, uh, that we've, uh, uh, you know, that we're, we're solving everything by just doing a little bit, that, that we understand the reality uh, of, uh, of what we're facing uh, as a state going forward and use this opportunity to, to set a truly sustainable budget as opposed to one that just gets us through the next fiscal year and then we collapse again. Um, so those are the three things. Uh, picking up on Ben's uh, 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 discussion of of an equal opportunity to set the agenda, an equal opportunity to invite guests, an equal opportunity to to get information uh, out in the public. Those are the three things that I think are critically important uh, for uh, for those who who want to uh, preserve the PFD uh, and for those who want to make this a lasting solution uh, to get out in the public. Who pays? The fact that PFD cuts push the burden. Uh, uh, the largest share of the burden, the, the bulk of the burden to middle and lower income Alaska families, uh, the relative economic impacts of the options, the fact that PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, and then the reality check of uh, what the futures market is telling us about oil prices. 
I, I think that the presentation of those uh, ought to be uh, uh, front and center. Uh, and then used, as I said, as a as a keystone to go back and and or uh, to touch uh, uh, as uh, as as the as the deliberations go forward. And I personally would love to see, you know, I don't know if it's the fourth thing or three point five or whatever it is, but I think uh, this uh, thing that Lyman Hoffman has been on and talked about several times and should be a continual touchstone inside this group is the fact that the framers. Uh, of the permanent fund itself had intended that the permanent fund and then once the permanent fund dividend was established that it have first call uh, that that is needs to be a continual touchstone and a guide stone on those things over and over and over again because I think that's an important thing to remember that this was the people's money first and that uh, you know government spending needs to take a back seat to it uh, as was intended by those who set it up initially. Uh, so that might be a more of a footnote than a full-on talking point, but I think it needs to continually be touched on. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Michael. And and certainly you can build a whole presentation around uh, uh, Governor Hammond's uh, quotes and Governor Hammond's uh, intentions as well. And Lyman's just fits right in with that. I mean, Lyman is just, uh, it, 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 it as is fitting, because Lyman represents the Senate district that Governor Hammond represented, uh, the same area that Governor Hammond represented when he was in the Senate. Uh, of course, Bryce represents the Senate district, Governor Hammond. So that's not always a good thing. But but Lyman, I mean, think Lyman is just a continuation of the of the theme that uh, the Governor Hammond set down when he represented the same area in the Senate. So um, I, I, I think that I think that would be a good thing. But but that sort of that that sort of background, I think, is is highly useful, highly important, and 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 very important to, to use as a as a touchstone as well. I agree. But but the current factors of who pays, economic impact, uh, and reality check on the future, I think uh, I think are equally as important. I had an interesting conversation um, with some folks uh, the other day, and they were talking about okay, great working group. Uh, and I wanted to get I wanted to get Brad's take on this, and so let me let me quote this properly so that I make sure that I formulate the argument uh, together. Uh, and that is uh, the question is, um, uh, hey, you know, five Dems and three Republicans on a working group with thirty five Republicans in the legislatures and only twenty two Democrats. Um, and what is the deal with Machiki appointing? one Republican and one Democrat for majority with 13 Republicans and one Democrat. And uh, I got to say that that it, I hadn't thought about it from that perspective, uh, but it is interesting. Brad, what, what say you? Oh, it's Lyman. I mean, we're, we're Lyman's a Democrat, nominally a Democrat, right, right. but he's a, he's part of the uh, uh, part of the Senate majority. And I think frankly, uh, putting Lyman on the committee, uh, is is a brilliant move by uh, by uh, Senator Machiki. I don't think it's a I don't think a, it's a backwards move at all. Lyman is a link to the past. You were talking about the comments he's made about the permanent fund uh, uh, in the past. Lyman is the longest serving legislator in Alaska history. Goes back to uh, overlapping almost all the way back to uh, the passage of the permanent fund statute, but goes back to over lapping with legislators who were there and who created uh, the permanent fund statute knows uh, what was uh, has a good feel for what was in their minds. Uh, Lyman's a link to the Democrats uh, 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 is nominally a Democrat uh, sometimes caucuses with Democrats depending upon the depending upon the uh, the, the legislature um, and um, and I think has a good attachment to the Democrats is a link to the Bush. Uh, uh, is uh, is is uh, an important uh, um, uh, link to you know how rural Alaska uh, deals with things, uh, and Lyman is motivated. I mean, I, I the 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 defeat of the uh, reverse sweep uh, by the House Republicans. I think uh, it, we may look back on that as the key to finally getting the PFD uh, resolved because it because it put the PCE in play. And if there's anything that motivates Lyman, it is the PCE, uh, preserving the power cost equalization, which uh, many would accurately say he is the father of, or at least the the, the, the chief protector of uh, during the decades. 
Um, so I, I think Lyman is a, is, is a, is a brilliant choice, uh, to serve on the committee. And the fact that he's a, that he's nominally a Dem and that makes it, you know, that makes it five Dems and, and, uh, and, and three Republicans, I, that doesn't bother me, uh, uh, in, in the least, uh, because I think it is a key play to, uh, to move this forward. If it were, if, if he had appointed shower, Senator shower instead, uh, or 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 one of the another of the uh, excuse me another of the um, uh, Senate Republicans conservative Senate Republicans that certainly would have uh, certainly would have uh, uh, solidified that position uh, in working group but I don't think it would have led to the kind of give and take that uh, that Lyman's able to bring to the table to uh, to bring this forward so I I don't have a problem at all. Uh, with uh, with putting uh, with putting Lyman on the committee and uh, and making him and in fact I think it's a brilliant move to make him co-chair uh, and de facto head of the committee. I, he 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 is motivated to get this done, uh, and you want a motivated chair uh, who knows all of the levers of power. I mean, Bert Stedman sort of learned his tricks from Lyman, so <laughs> you you uh, you want a motivated chair who knows all of the all of the levers and who's motivated to. Uh, 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 bring this to closure in a way that that makes permanent both the PFD and the PCE. Um, my react that's my reaction in any event. I, I don't know if that's a sterling endorsement, Brad, to say that Bert Stedman learned all his tricks from Ly or from Lyman. I don't know if that's necessarily the endorsement that I was looking for, but you know, Lyman reminds me uh, really of the you know remember the days when the Bush caucus was basically. Um, uh, you know, aligned closely with the more conservative majority across the state of Alaska. That went on for many years, and really he he harkens back to that, I think, in many ways. Uh, but you're right. I mean, he's motivated by his own personal, uh, his own personal uh, journey and legacy, which is the PCE. And so at least you know where he's coming from, I think, on that, uh, on that point. May not be, uh, you know, the, the best choice for everybody, but at least – uh, you know where he's coming from on that. Do you want to give me the brief uh, intro and tease to number two, which is Governor Dunleavy and misunderstanding, I guess, what revenue is all about? Yeah, it's a. This may be my. This may instead of the weekly top three, this may be my lifetime top three because this is a. This is a an issue that I keep coming back to because it continues to bother me. Uh, in a in a in a very good uh, uh, interview. Uh, reported in the Fairbanks News Miner uh, last week, uh, there was a, a paragraph that says this. Asked later in the interview if he would consider raising taxes, Dunleavy said, would I consider raising taxes to cover costs that keep going up? I'm willing to have a discussion on revenues if the legislature is willing to have a serious discussion on a constitutional spending limit. That works. Okay, that that makes sense. In the sense of, if we're going to talk about revenues, we need to talk about spending limits. I'm 100% behind that. The problem is, we do need to be talking about revenues, and 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 as I've said continually uh, 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 over the past uh, few months now, the governor needs to take the lead, needs to take a lead in uh, in in talking about revenues. It's not. This isn't. This isn't the governor saying we need – when he talks about revenues, this isn't the governor saying we need to increase spending. This is, is the reality check of the fact that there is not the political will uh, in the legislature, in the state, to, to make uh, deep spending cuts, the kind of spending cuts necessary to avoid uh, any sort of, uh, of revenues, and the reality that if you're not going to have those deep spending cuts, and we're not, uh, the reality that there's going to have to be some revenues, and in order to avoid PFD cuts being those revenues, then we have to have a substitute set of re revenues, and that's where I, that's where the governor needs to take the lead. And this this sort of this sort of continual laying behind the rock rock. Oh, I'll talk about I'll talk about revenues. We'll have a discussion about revenues. Uh, I think it's just it, it's denying reality, and it's and it's you know it it, it is it is uh, passing on an opportunity uh, that uh, an important opportunity, an important obligation. I think the governor has to get out in front and talk about revenues. If he if if he wants to control the revenue discussion, he needs to get out in front. We're in the middle of number two, 
which was the uh, governor's discussion on revenue. This is something we've been talking about, Brad, a lot because the governor came up with SJR 6, which we both agree is probably the best viable plan based on political reality and, and what the will is. Uh, of the legislature because it just seems like that the statutory PFD, nobody even wants to touch it, which is unfortunate because that's what we support. But uh, in all things being equal, this SGR 6 plan came out and it's good. The one fatal flaw is that it has a big gaping hole in the middle of it. It's got this revenue hole. And many have continued to ask the governor for more ideas and how he plans to fix that. He says it's whack-a-mole. He said he keeps offering ideas and they keep shooting it down. But I'm not seeing any substantive ideas coming out of this. And I think that's what you're referring to. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. It's not whack-a-mole. The governor, the governor has not offered uh, any any uh, uh, revenue proposals. Senator Shower, Senator Hughes uh, have uh, when they've talked about sales taxes, those are not uh, those are not uh, revenue options that I think are appropriate. They still shove a bunch of the cost of middle and lower income Alaska families. If that's what we're concerned about in the PFD, we should be concerned about the same impact uh, from a sales tax. Uh, but at least they've talked about revenues and and I give them a lot of credit uh, for Senator Shower and Senator Hughes. A lot of credit for about about being real and and you know trying to take the next step forward the governor's not uh come forward with any revenue options in private i've had people say that uh, oh the governor will uh, the governor would favor a, a sales tax and we've had debates as i as i just indicated about that that type of revenue approach but the governor's not even put that on the table and i and i think it's just it as senator shower and, and senator hughes and senator wilson the, the entire Valley Senate delegation, as they've all recognized, um, uh, revenues are going to be part, ha have to be a part. We are not going to get even even uh, uh, legislative approval for a PFD constitutional amendment without those who are concerned uh, about about where the state's headed after that, uh, having some uh, comfort level with respect to uh, with respect to uh, some revenues. We're not going to have a constitutional amendment on the PFD without without some some revenues and for the governor to just abdicate on that issue and say oh I'll discuss it I mean this is like this is like my mother used to say or or probably your mother uh, hi Sally um, used to say you know we'll discuss it you knew what that meant right <laughs> you, you you knew it wasn't going to happen right 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 no and I um, I I agree I agree with that. Um, you know, uh, Chris is saying in the chat room, what's Brad talking about? The governor offered the 50-50 split. You're right. The 50-50 split is what SJR 6 is about, constitutionalizing the PFD. But the problem is, is just like this current budget, it leaves us underfunded. There's not enough, you know, basically the idea is that there's not enough money to pay for everything. With that 50-50 split, it leaves a gaping revenue hole. That's exactly. I mean, that's why we have PFD cuts. Because there's a gaping revenue hole, there will continue to be a gaping revenue hole, and 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 you're not going to get the Jonathan Christ Tompkins, uh, the Jesse Keels, uh, the others who are concerned about uh, uh, continuing to support state services. You know whether we like it or not, whether the fiscal conservatives like it or not, you're not going to get them to agree, and they they will they have enough to block a constitutional amendment in the in the legislature. You're not going to get them to agree. Uh, to a constitutional amendment until they know how they're going to they're going to fund the gap. They're not going to leave. They're not going to take their hands off the PFD. Uh, not going to you know give it, let it go uh, as a as a revenue source until they know what substitute revenue that there is going to be, and what that substitute rev revenue source is going to be. So, yeah, it's I mean for the governor for anybody to claim that 50-50 is the solution, the only solution we need. And it's whack-a-mole for anybody to complain that he hasn't offered more. That's just wrong because 50-50 is not a complete solution. 50-50 gets us part of the way there. Um, the 50% that goes to government gets us a, a part of the way there. But there's still about a billion dollar or more gap uh, that has to be dealt with. And we're not going to get we're not going to get people to take their fingers off the PFD uh, as long as that billion as long as you know, we're, 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 we're not addressing how that billion dollar gap is going to be filled. Brad, uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, we're continuing our discussions now on the weekly top three. 
Um, one final thought. Um, uh, one final thought on that. Uh, as Chris says again, Brad's being disingenuous, suggesting the governor hasn't offered anything. There's been nothing substantive that's that he's offered. He said we'll have discussions about it down the road, but that's not like, again, I think you pointed out Mike Schauer specifically brought up several different options when he was discussing and comparing uh, sales tax plans from South Dakota and Wyoming. Specifically, he laid out a map. He laid out a roadmap with those slides and the monies, and he shows it. Here's where the money would come from. Here's where it would go. He did one with the oil rep, with new oil revenues. He did, I mean, he, he put out these different plans and said, here's four or five or six different options. The governor has not done that. Yeah, the governor's not offered anything uh, for that gap. He said he, he said we'll discuss it. And like I like I said a moment ago, you know, you know when Sally said that to you, and when my mother said it to me, we know what that means. So it's um it's 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 disingenuous. I'll, I'll turn it around. It's disingenuous for the governor to claim that it's whack a mole because the governor's never popped a mole up uh, with uh, with respect to this issue. Chris uh, says, and and I agree with Chris uh, on on part of this. He says, uh, uh, he said, I uh, I rip standing tall Dunleavy harder than anyone, but Brad is being completely unfair, and this is in regards to the revenue. And my response to that is, well, I mean, he name a revenue or tax idea or something that the governor has come up with. The only thing that he's outlined in this 50-50 is this amorphous amount of money that he wants to cut, where he says, oh, well, we'll just cut this much out. Now, while we all agree on, um, you know, we all agree on that, uh, you know, we want the we want the government size and scope of government to be cut, an amorphous cut, first of all, will go almost nowhere, even a targeted cut at this point. It, we've seen that there's no political will to cut what we've got going on right now. So that is almost a non-starter from the get-go. There's got to be, you know, you have to have a, a, a handful of options out there that people could pick and choose from. And the governor has just proposed this amorphous, we'll cut it to a balanced position. Brad, am I wrong? No, you're absolutely right. And, and yeah. You know, I, I Chris may rip the stand, standing tall as much as anybody. I don't know who Chris is or or what he rips the governor about. But the governor has not proposed a complete budget, and we are not going to get. I mean, just look, the reality of it is, we are not going to get PFD constitutionalized uh, without closing that additional revenue gap. And the governor has made no proposal. Uh, with respect to closing uh, that additional revenue gap, and people, people who are telling themselves that oh, we'll just you know we'll we'll cut spend we'll be able to cut spending once we get that other fifty percent. We've already had the other fifty percent of the of the of the revenue from the POMV, and we weren't able to close the budget. We have these huge budget deficits, and that's why we've had deep PFD cuts to help close the remainder of the. Uh, uh, of the deficit. Those PFD cuts will continue unless we have substitute, substitute revenues. And the governor is not proposing a complete package that saves the PFD until he proposes substitute revenues that would replace uh, continued PFD cuts. And when we're talking about substitute revenues at this point, we are talking about taxes, either taxes on individuals or more taxes on the oil companies or whatever else, because the legislature has shown absolutely zero will to cut the size and scope of government. We've been beating on the cut the size and scope. I mean, I've been beating on it for 20 years. I know Brad and I together have been beating on it for the last six or seven years. And only in the last year or so has Brad basically started talking about specifically taxes as revenue because there is no political will to cut the budgets. I mean, we could we could rip our hair out and shout from the rooftops that we want you to cut the size and scope of government, and that's how you get there. But they are the ones that have the levers of control, and they are not doing it. So if you don't at least engage them in the argument at their level, we're just going to get run over. Yeah, we have been run over. We will continue to be run over. And 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 the poster child for all this, you don't need to look any farther than Sarah Rasmussen. Sarah Rasmussen ran as a fiscal conservative. She's going to get in there. She's going to bring government spending down. She's going to get control of the budget. She gets in there, 
<laughs> and 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 all of a sudden, well, we can't cut this, we can't cut that. My constituents want this, my constituents want want that. I mean, just repeat that forty times through the House, twenty times through the through the Senate, and that's that's where we are. Everybody's got this or that thing uh, uh, that 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 they that they want to protect. Uh, and and they don't want to include in in budget cuts. I mean, we saw that in 2019 when the governor tried to cut the budget. Everybody, every legislator came back and said, oh, I can support some of these, but I can't support this. Don't cut this. And when you add up 60 legislators, that that meant no budget, no significant budget cuts. I mean, it's just reality, folks. If you if you don't if you don't think that's reality, if you think that all we need to do is pass the PFD amendment, and it'll, 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 you know, everything will be fine from there on in. It ain't gonna happen. And and if you want to save the PFD, if you, instead of instead of just talking about it, if you want to actually help to save the PFD, you need to start talking about what substitute revenues are going to replace PFD cuts. Because if we don't have that discussion and don't agree on something, PFD cuts aren't going to go away. Right. Well, and and then Chris says, well, if and when the PFD is protected by the Constitution, then cutting government becomes the default. Well, you're right, but you've got a cart and a horse thing here. You've got a chicken and an egg problem. To get to that point, you've got to propose some kind. Now, it doesn't mean that it can't change down the road, but you at least have to have a viable option for them to be willing to look at putting the PFD in the Because they understand that. They understand that if you constitutionalize it, that that takes a huge pot of money off the table. You've got to give them a viable option, a carrot, so to speak, so that when you do get there, then you could fight it out and decide whether or not you want to do tax taxation or cuts, and then they have no choice. They have to face one or the other. But if you don't give that to them before that, it will never get constitutionalized. Brad, you got about a minute. Well, it won't, Michael. I mean, it'll be the flip side of what we just had with the with the House minority standing up and saying we're not going to vote for the for the uh, reverse sweep. You will have the the those who believe in continuing government services over in the, at least in the House, probably in the Senate, standing up and saying, I'm not voting, voting for a constitutional amendment until you tell me what substitute revenues are going to be out there. And you're never going to get the constitutional amendment out of out of the House. Sure, if you got it magically, then yes, the only default would be cuts. But you're never going to get it out of the legislature. You're never going to get it out of the House if you don't if you don't answer the revenue question. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, I mean, I don't mean to sound agitated by this, but I'm agitated because we keep coming back to, oh, we'll just cut. It's it's not. It's 20 years, man. 20 years. I've been beating this drum. It's not working. So. And Michael, those who keep saying that are the ones who are responsible for PFD cuts. Because without substitute revenues, the only tool left got is PFD cuts. Got to go. Um, <clears throat> all right. So, uh, let's move on to number three. Uh, number three in the discussion is the targeting of Alaskans LNG by the Biden administration. And you think this is going to have, uh, consequences here? Yeah, this, this, this recent action by the Biden administration to pull back the authorization for uh, the LNG project, the Alaska LNG project, and subject it to an additional environmental review really troubles me. Um, I follow the LNG industry closely, the U.S. LNG, the global LNG industry closely, um, and and it, this, this this is a targeting of Alaska. He's not done this with other LNG projects um, in the Gulf Coast, uh, particularly uh uh, that are similarly situated to Alaska, that is, have their certificates, are still trying to put economics together. Um, there are other projects like that uh, that are in that similar situation. He's not, the, the administration has not targeted those uh, for this additional environmental review. And and the real concern I have is, is what they described as the reason for the additional uh, environmental review in the uh, uh, Alaska Public Media uh, write up on it. It says, "quote Under the review, regulator, regulators will take a fresh look at the environmental impacts of natural gas production on Alaska's North Slope. Plus, they'll and analyze the project's full greenhouse gas uh, emission potential from its extraction to the export and overseas. The federal government could then decide whether to keep, change, or overturn approval of the project." The fact that they're going to look at the upstream aspects, the natural gas, the, the production aspects 
uh, of this project is of a, is a significant concern to me because if they find that those upstream uh, aspects that that the production of the gas is is environmentally uh, 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 inappropriate uh, and that's the reason they would reject or that's the reason they question the the LNG project then that would carry over to the production aspects of any other uh, leases permits that uh, that the federal government might be uh, might be required to give or might might be needed uh, for North Slope activity and that so so this affects only gas but that sort of carryover that the that the production is a problem that sort of carryover would start affecting the oil side as well and I think that's the that's the big thing is as they start to extrapolate these things out to the higher and higher functions, all of a sudden, although it may look good on paper in Alaska, as they start to ascribe you know carbon footprint and all these other greenhouse mechanisms to this uh, to this stuff, it's going to make more and more projects in Alaska. If that becomes the new standard or the new norm, that's going to make it more difficult to you know to develop uh, Alaska gas and oil in the future. Yeah, exactly right. If this bleeds over. If this bleeds over into the BLM, the way the BLM is going to look at new leases, I mean, remember that that, that they held new lease, they've suspended the issuance of new leases pending the uh, pending the outcome of a of a review, uh, a policy review. If this sort of policy issue that they're articulating on the on the LNG side bleeds over and becomes part of the BLM review, which I I, I think it likely is going to do. Uh, then, then that means we've got problems on the on the BLM lease side and on step outs from uh, new leases uh, from uh, uh, from uh, uh, in MPRA uh, and uh, and elsewhere on the slope. So it's it's um this is this is very troubling because of the targeting. I mean, if they were doing if they would did if they did all LNG projects that were in the same situation, if they said, look, we're just going to have a blanket review of all these projects, okay. I wouldn't be as concerned, but this one is targeted at Alaska, uh, and it's targeted at the upstream issue, and and that is that is where uh, that's where a lot of concern uh, ought to ought to come out of uh, come, come out of this uh, this step. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest. Brad, uh, last forty seconds here. Your final thoughts. Um, I think the working group is a is a is a big important step, but I hope Ben and others, Shelley and others, are able to use their uh, position on it to get those three issues uh, who pays uh, the impact the, the 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 impact on the Alaska economy of the various uh, measures and uh, and reality check on oil prices I hope they're able to use their position on the committee to get those front and center and to keep them front and center through the considerations Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, ak4sb.com is their website. We've also got links on our Facebook uh, chat room this morning uh, to their Facebook page. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.